I would like to introduce you to um, today's presenter, Stacy Buck. Stacy is the president and senior consultant at RadRx. She has 29 years experience in the healthcare industry. During her career, she served as an internal auditor and corporate compliance officer for one of the nation's largest providers of diagnostic imaging services. Additionally, she served as vice president and consultant for a radiology consulting firm and radiology billing company. Stacy has served in a consulting capacity for 19 years, and she's a nationally thought out speaker who's presented well over 200 seminars. She has authored articles um, on radiology coding and reimbursement topics for numerous publications. She's the author of Cracking the IR Code, Your Comprehensive Guide to Mastering Interventional Radiology Coding, and the creator of the online course, Mastering Interventional Radiology and Cardiology Coding. Uh, Stacy's contributions to her profession have been recognized by her peers through several awards, the FHIMA Distinguished Member Award, FHIMA Outstanding Professional Award, FHIMA Distinguished Service Award, and the FHIMA Literacy Award, AHIMA Triumph Rising Star Award, and the AHIMA Triumph Mentor Award. Um, so we're thrilled to have Stacy with us today. Um, and with that, I'm going to stop sharing my webcam and I'm going to hand it over to, to Stacy. Thank you, Sharon, very much. It's a pleasure for me to be here with everyone today. Obviously, you all have my long, boring bio. <laughs> we could have done that a lot shorter. Um, but anyway, um, I'm thrilled to be here today to talk about mastering interventional radiology coding basics. Interventional radiology is one of those areas that coders always seem to struggle with a bit and find the most challenging. And so what I'm attempt, I've attempted to do today is kind of give you an overview of catheterization coding basics and then also talk a little bit about diagnostic angiography. The main focus of the session today, I want to really hone in on the catheterization coding roles because that seems to be one of the most difficult areas when someone is starting out learning interventional radi radiology to master. And so just a few things before I get started. Um, you will have, in addition to the slides, there was a separate handout that I provided where there are actually 27 different coding scenarios for you to practice after today's session. Obviously, in 90 minutes, I do not have time to go through all those coding scenarios, but I will be walking you through um, some different coding scenarios today on the screen using vascular illustrations. So you can actually visualize how the coding takes place during these procedures. And before we get into that, I just want to tell everybody, this is an area, interventional radiology takes a while to master. If you think that you're going to listen to a webinar and, you know, get this, you know, overnight, it's simply not going to happen. It's all about repetition with interventional radiology. For example, what I'm going to be going over with you today, normally I take five to six hours to teach it because I use repetition and I go through a lot of different coding scenarios and I go through different operative reports. Um, you know, with students, whether I'm teaching them in person or whether or not they're enrolled in my online course, it's all about repetition. So what I'm going to try to do is take those principles that you would, you know, be applying in the five to six hours of the hands-on practice and actually reduce it to 90 minutes and give you those basics and start to show you how to apply those coding rules. And I think by giving you a visual um, that that's actually going to, to help you understand catheterization coding if it's something that you've been struggling with. And at the end of the presentation, there is a promo code or a coupon code for those people who are attending this webinar. You can actually get a discount on the online course. So if you like what you see today and you want more of it, I have lots, lots more for you, um, lots, lots more in depth. So thank you again to TrueCode for inviting me to present this webinar. Most appreciated. So the first thing I want to talk about are key documentation points for interventional radiology coding. IR coding is challenging, but it doesn't have to be as challenging if you have great documentation. So if your physicians are giving you good documentation, that is, I feel like, half of the battle, um, you know, that you need to, you know, win in order to be successful at interventional radiology coding. So some of the things that you're going to want to focus on in particular to make sure that you're assigning your codes correctly are for you, are here for you on this slide. The first key piece of information that is going to drive your catheterization code is knowing the catheter insertion point. Where did the interventional radiologist first gain access for that procedure? Most commonly, they'll gain access at the right common femoral artery, 
but it could be any number of vessels throughout the body to do the procedure. That's the first key piece of information that you'll have to identify. Also, if there are multiple points of access, that's not something I'm going to get into today because that's a little bit more advanced, but the physician may gain access into the vascular system via separate access sites. And if that's the case, then it's sort of like coding two separate procedures. So that's why that's significant. And then as far as catheterizations are concerned, you'll want to look for terminology such as contralateral retrograde catheterization, ipsilateral antegrade, and those are terms that all of us as coders are familiar with, but those are key in interventional radiology because those are significant in catheterization coding. You'll also want to know where the catheter ended up, that final destination during the procedure, and also during the procedure, you'll have to take note of all of the vessels catheterized. And then, so you'll want to take note of all the vessels visualized everywhere the physician is placing that catheter for a contrast injection you'll want to make note of that and in order to assign an imaging code an interpretation has to be documented and then if he uses any guidance to perform the procedure and then any prior imaging studies there should be mentioned hopefully in the interventional radiology report that becomes significant when you're coding for therapeutic interventions your angioplasty stent atherectomy because there are certain conditions that need to be present in order for you to code for repeat diagnostic studies. And again, that's more advanced, so that's not something we're gonna talk about today. Now, just briefly, I wanna mention abnormal anatomy. And the only reason I'm mentioning this, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it, is just to let you know that when a patient has abnormal anatomy, that is going to change your catheterization coding. It is going to change your vascular order, first, second, and third order, depending upon the branching pattern. And so these slides right here, I'm not going to go through them because this is jam-packed today. I'm going to go all 90 minutes. I can guarantee you that. Um, but it's here for your reference about the more common abnormal anatomy that you may see during procedures. And as I said, just know that this is going to change your vascular families and it's going to change your vascular orders when you're assigning your catheterization code. For example, here's a, a picture of a bovine arch. And what this is showing is we have two vascular families that are coming off of the aortic arch. We have a vascular family that starts with the left subclavian and then a vascular family that starts with the brachiocephalic. And in a normal anatomy, it's actually three vascular families where the left common carotid comes directly off the aortic arch and it does not come off of that brachiocephalic. And then here's another example, again, of abnormal anatomy with the, with the aberrant subclavian. We now have four vascular families that are coming off of the aorta. So again, for now, that's really just here for your reference. We're not going to get into coding for abnormal anatomy today. That's something, again, that would be more advanced. So we're going to start with the basics. So briefly, just some points about diagnostic angiography documentation before we start getting into catheterization. When a physician performs a diagnostic angiogram, it may be reported when it's not otherwise bundled with a therapeutic intervention. Um, that will occur with some of those other procedures that are being performed. And as I mentioned, if there's a repeat diagnostic angiogram, it may be reported under certain conditions. In order to report diagnostic angiography, a complete diagnostic angiogram must be documented in the report. So the physician has to give you findings. If you see mention of a contrast injection, and there's no findings after that vessel, you know, contrast is ingest, injected into that vessel, then you would not be able to code a diagnostic imaging code. And sometimes they're just simply doing the contrast injections in order to guide them during the procedures um, or map them out so they can see, you know, where they're going and, and what they're doing. So there isn't anything, you know, separate to code in those instances. It has to be truly diagnostic in nature. So now let's get into our main topic for today, catheterization coding. The first key to understanding catheterization coding is understanding the difference between non-selective and selective catheterization coding. And once you grasp that and then all of the rules that apply to catheterization coding, you have gone a long way in learning interventional radiology coding. It's like the first hurdle um, that you need to cross. So as far as catheterization coding is concerned, specifically, this is the documentation, again, just to review what you want to look for. The access site has to be clearly documented. That's the first key piece of information that is going to drive that catheterization code. And then if a second access is required, let's say the physician gained access at the right common femoral artery and then had to gain access in the left common femoral artery, it's important that the physician tells you the specific work done through each access because that is a huge 
huge um, you know, factor in selecting the correct catheterization codes. All catheter placements have to be clearly documented. And then if they're catheterizing multiple branches, they need to document the number of branches and the specific branches. Multiple branches is not sufficient. I know some doctors like to say multiple branches were catheterized, but when I'm querying them, I'm like, doctor, you need to tell me at least how many separate branches you're doing because I can't give you more than two when you say that there's multiple branches. So just some documentation points there for catheterization. So the first term we're going to look at is non-selective catheterization. And this is when the catheter or needle is placed directly into an artery or a vein. If we're talking about the venous system today, we're focusing strictly on the arterial system. And the reason why I always teach the basics from the arterial system is because the majority of the procedures are performed in the arterial system. So it's into an artery or a vein and it's not advanced any further or it's advanced only into the aorta. And the non-selective codes that we have to choose from are listed here. We have 36100, which is a direct puncture into a carotid or vertebral artery. That is extremely, extremely rare. I can't even tell you the last time that I saw that direct puncture performed. 36140 is a non-selective catheterization of an upper or lower extremity artery. 36160 is a direct translumbar puncture into the aorta. That typically is done when they suspect that a patient may have an endo leak and they'll do that direct puncture for imaging. And then 36200 is when the catheter is placed in the aorta. So those are our non-selective codes. Now some examples of non-selective catheterization. So these are listed for you here, but in a few moments, I'm actually gonna walk you through and show you the thought process in applying these codes and the selective codes. So if in the beginning you're like, I'm a little lost, Stacy. Don't worry, I think when I get over to the drawing and I illustrate it for you, it will start to come together. So an example of a non-selective catheterization is when the physician punctures a right common femoral artery and then he doesn't move the catheter any further. There's no additional catheter work. That's straightforward, that's a 36140. However, if the physician punctures at that right common femoral artery, then advances the catheter into the aorta, the aorta catheterization is reported with 36200, and that initial access, the 36140, that goes away, that gets bundled into the 36200. And then I just have two examples for you for the venous system, just as an FYI. So these are our selective catheterization codes that we are using for procedures above the diaphragm, 36215, 216, 217, 218. These are all for procedures above the diaphragm. In just a moment, we'll look at the codes for below. And so these are used when the catheter is moved into the arterial system beyond the aorta or the vessel that's punctured. And of course, these are structured with 36215 being a first order branch, 36216 a second order, 36217 being a third order, and then 36218 is for additional second or third order branches within the same vascular family. On the next slide, we have the codes for the procedures that are, that should say below the diaphragm. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's it. as many times as I proofed this slide deck. Um, these are for procedures that are below the diaphragm. 36245, 36246, 36247, 36248. Um, so you'll just wanna make a note of that on your handout. Codes are used for procedures below the diaphragm, the ones that we're looking at now. So these are going to be for your visceral vessels, your lower extremity studies, and these are structured the same way. They're just different code numbers um, that are going to be used for selective catheterization. And today I'm gonna to walk you through the application of both. I'll actually show you examples of how to apply um, for all of those different types of procedures. So here's some examples of selective catheterization right common femoral artery access, the catheter is advanced to the aorta, and then from there it goes into the subclavian artery, that's a first order. So we had an initial access, which would have been a 36140, then the catheter went to the aorta, the aorta would be a 36200, but then when the catheter goes into the left subclavian artery, we now have a 36215, and those lesser non-selective catheterizations are bundled into that. So a common um, coding error that I see with those who are newer to interventional radiology is they wanna code for every place that that catheter stopped. And that's actually not what you do. You actually are going to be coding for that selective catheterization over non-selective, meaning non-selective will always be bundled into that. And then lesser order are always going to be bundled into higher order. 
And then another example of a selective catheterization is again, that right common femoral artery access, catheter goes into the aorta, and then it goes into the celiac artery because that's below the diaphragm, that would be code 36245 um, for that first order vessel. And then in the third bullet point there, in that third example, here we have the same access, but the catheter goes over into the left superficial femoral artery, that's going to be a 36247, a third order vessel. So now I'm gonna go through the catheterization coding rules. And then once I go through these with you, then I'm going to jump over to some drawings and I'm gonna walk you through application of the code. So again, if it's, it still seems a little muddy for you right now, I think once I get to that point where I'm showing you, it will all start to come together. So as I already mentioned, you will always code selective catheterization over non-selective catheterization. Those non-selective catheterizations are going to be bundled into the selective catheterization codes. You will also code to the highest order of selectivity. That's why it's very important that you know the furthest place that that catheter was moved to because you're going to code based on that. That's the first thing that you'll want to know after the site of access. You'll also code each vascular family separately. And you'll see that in a moment. We'll look at how to code multiple vascular families. And each vascular family will have a set of codes. And you will code that to the highest order selected. And then there are add-on codes for additional branches within the same vascular family. I'll show you how to apply those. And then, as I mentioned, each vac vascular access is coded separately. So when you have additional branches in the same family that are catheterized, you're only going to report one initial catheter placement per vascular family. So that's very important to remember. When I say one initial catheter placement, I mean you get one of the codes, like 36215, 216, or 217, based on the furthest that they move the catheter, or a 36245, 46, and 47 if it's below the diaphragm. Then after that, you'll use the add-on codes if the physician pulls the catheter back and then advances into a different branch within the same family. And then those add-on codes can be reported multiple times. Each vascular family is going to be coded separately when two or more vascular families are catheterized, which very commonly happens in procedures. And as I mentioned, you're going to assign an initial catheter placement code for each vascular family, and then you're going to use your add-on codes as needed. So before I move on to just a couple of slides on diagnostic angiography, I'm going to jump over to one of the drawings and kind of explain to you and show you how this works. Okay, so here's a typical procedure. I'm just gonna jump in and I'm gonna show you the thought process in coding a typical procedure. So let's assume that the physician gains access at the right common femoral artery. Now, you don't see that here on the right on the drawing, but I'm gonna go ahead and mark it with an X. So you're imagining that he's gained access in that lower extremity. As soon as he punctures that artery there, we have a 36140 for that puncture, okay? If the physician didn't go any further and he didn't do any additional work, then we're, it's one and done, 36140. However, once the catheter goes into the aorta here, we now have a 36200 that describes the catheter work that was done. And then the 36140 that we started out with, with that puncture, that actually gets dropped. It goes away because it's bundled with 36200. So if the physician stopped the procedure here and didn't do anything further, we have a 36200 as our only catheterization code. But what commonly happens is the physician will go into the different vascular families and do additional catheterizations and imaging there. So off of the aorta, a patient that has normal anatomy, they have three vascular families. So you see here, there's the left subclavian. That is one vascular family. We have the left common carotid, which is another vascular family off of the aorta. And then we have the brachiocephalic or dominant artery, which is another vascular family off of the aorta. And so to apply your catheterization codes, you're actually going to be coding each vascular family separately. So if the physician catheterizes all three families, then you're going to have three sets of catheterization codes to describe that. So let's say, I'll, do, I'll just put in a basic common procedure right now. 
So again, we're starting at the access with that right common femoral artery. When we get the puncture, that's 36140. But once the catheter goes into the aorta, our catheterization code becomes 36200, okay? But once the catheter goes into the left common carotid, and I use X's. Um, during today's presentation, when I, always, when I always teach, I use an X to mark a catheter placement, and I use an O. When I circle the X, it tells you that imaging was done. That's kind of my little method that I use. Um, so here, the catheter went into the left common carotid, and you'll see that the left common carotid is a first order vessel, 36215. This code, 36200, is now bundled into the 36215. We do not assign that code. So this is the final destination. If this was the end of the procedure, the final destination that the physician reached is the left common carotid. It's the furthest he moved the catheter. That's a first order catheterization. All those catheterizations that came before it are bundled and the only code that we have to assign is 36215. So now I'm gonna continue the procedure. Let's say the physician didn't stop here, but he pulled the catheter back out of the common left common carotid and then went into the right common carotid and then placed the catheter over there. So now what happens? We have two vascular families that are catheterized. So we already know that our non-selective codes, 36140, 36200, already got bundled with the 36215. So now we come over here into this vascular family, the right common carotid is a second order catheterization and so we have two separate vascular families, so we code for each separately. So what we'll end up um, assigning for our catheterization codes here, if the physician doesn't do any work, any more work, is 36215 for the left common carotid and then 36216 for the right common carotid. So super easy so far, right? <laughs> it, should, it should be, it's, it's gonna get more complicated when we add more steps here. So I will say by doing that, assigning a 36215 with a 36216, you will need an NCCI modifier on that 36215. What I'm teaching, I usually just use 59 as a generic modifier. You may be using X modifiers, you may be using other NCCI modifiers, but the point is you'll always need an NCCI modifier on your lesser order code so it doesn't bundle with that higher order. So let's continue on. So physician does this procedure, he's not done here. He decides he's going to put the catheter also into the left internal carotid and the right internal carotid and the right external carotid. So now our drawing is getting a little bit more busy with the catheterization codes. So again, our non-selective codes, we know we're already bundled once we achieved access into the left common carotid, but over here, the physician places the catheter in the left internal carotid, which is a second order. So now that 36215, is bundled with the 36216, and the only code that we're assigning for this family over here is our 36216 for the left internal carotid. Then over here, catheter again was pulled back. This time he goes into the right internal carotid and the right external carotid. So now we have a third order catheterization with that right internal carotid, which means that our 36216 for the right common carotid gets bundled. We don't assign that. So right now we have 36216 for the left internal, 36217 for that right internal, but the physician pulled the catheter back and went into the right external carotid. That is also a third order catheterization. We cannot assign 36217 more than once for a vascular family. Because we can't assign that more than once, we need to use the add-on code 36218 to report the catheterization of the right external carotid. So that's how those add-on codes come into play. If over here on the left, the physician had placed the catheter in the left external carotid, over here we would have had two second order catheterizations and we can't assign that code two times for the same vascular family. We would assign 36216 for the first one and then 36218 for the second one. So that 36218 is going to be assigned for additional second order or additional third order. But the takeaway is that you want to make sure that you don't assign more than one of those codes per vascular family. So you have to pick one, a 36216 or a 36217, it's one and done, then you have to go to the add-on code. 
And then the physician may come over here and catheterize them, continuing the procedure. We're going all over it. Rather than starting over again from the beginning, it's easier if I just add on when we're crunched for time. So catheter, let's say, pulls back, goes into the left subclavian, then goes into the left vertebral. So over here, separate vascular family. So we're going to assign our catheterization codes here. We had a 36215 at the left subclavian, but then the physician moved the catheter into the left vertebral, which is a second order, a 36216. And then again, remember, we'll need our NCCI modifiers. So the 36216 codes that we're assigning for the left vertebral, left internal carotid, right internal, right, they don't bundle with these third order catheterizations over here. So hopefully that kind of helps put all the pieces together there. I think what I want to do is maybe do one more example. And I know some people get nervous. They're like, oh my gosh, you're taking so much time in the beginning. We'll never finish. We will start to move faster, I promise. <laughs> but I think it's worth it to stop in the beginning and try to walk you through and show you a procedure. So here again, we'll start with an axis of the right common femoral and we'll do catheterization of the aorta. And then this time we'll do catheterization of the right common carotid, right internal carotid, and we'll come over to the right vertebral, and then we'll do the left internal carotid here, and the left external carotid here, and then we'll also do the left subclavian over here. So what I do is I start out with the vascular family that has the least amount of catheterizations. That's just how I do it. I'm like, okay, this one's straightforward. Um, we'll start with the left subclavian. But remember, we're, I'm gonna walk you through the thought process. So the physician gains access at that right common femoral artery. We started with a 36140. Then as soon as he placed the catheter in the aorta, we dropped our 36140. And now we have a 36200. Then from there, once the catheter goes into the, any of those vascular families off the aorta, the 36200 goes away. So now in the left subclavian, we have a 36215. The catheter didn't go any further in that family. Over here, um, the catheter went all the way up into the left internal carotid, a second order vessel, and then also the left external carotid, a second order vessel. So remember, we can't use 36216 twice in the same vascular family. So we have to change that second 36216 to a 36218. And then over here, we have a separate vascular family, our third vascular family. We have the catheter that went into the right common carotid, which is a 36216. But once the catheter went into the right internal carotid, that code is bundled with the higher order, and that's not assigned. And now here the physician did a pullback and came over into the right vertebral, which is an additional third order. So we cannot assign 36217 twice for the same vascular family. So that second one becomes a 36218. So hopefully by walking you through um, what that looks like, it kind of helps pull all the coding rules together for you. And we'll I'll go back and I'll do some more of those um, as well. Um, today before we finish, once we start getting into the different sections. <clears throat> okay, so now I'm going to talk briefly about diagnostic angiography. And for the rest of the presentation, you will have slides in the deck about diagnostic angiography, but I'm not going to spend a ton of time on those um, because I find that the imaging piece of it, for the most part, coders are okay with it. It's pretty straightforward. I'm just going to point out some things um, that maybe are a little bit more challenging for some of the codes because I really want to focus on the catheterization coding and walking you through um, you know, examples in the lower extremities, upper extremities, and also the visceral vessels as well. So for your radiology supervision and interpretation codes, several codes will specify either unilateral or bilateral. So you want to make sure you read your code descriptions very carefully to make sure that you're selecting the appropriate code. The term selective is in some of the code descriptions, and the term selective actually relates back to your catheterization coding. What that means, if a code has the term selective in the description, that means that the catheter has to be in the vessel, in that vessel, when the contrast was injected in order to perform the imaging. 
So that's another reason why you have to understand that term selective catheterization because it will also affect your imaging codes. Now, some non-selective radiology codes are going to be bundled into selective codes. And we're gonna talk about that um, a little bit more throughout the slides. But just as a quick example, an aortogram 75625 will be bundled with other codes when it is performed. It will be bundled with uh, the visceral imaging code 75726. It will be bundled with renal angiography codes as well. You will use add-on codes for additional vessels within the same family. We have 75774, which is an add-on code for the arterial system, which we'll talk about today. And then to assign the RSNI codes, there has to be an interpretation of the vessel catheterized and image, which I've already spoken about. And then remember, there's not always a one-to-one -one ratio of imaging codes to surgical codes. And that's not really a significant anymore. Like years ago when everything was coded with component codes and I would teach interventional radiology coding, coders always thought for every surgical code that I assign, I have to have a corresponding radiology code to assign. And that was never true then. And it's even less true now because of the way they bundle um, all the work into single code. So just an FYI on that. So just to review regarding your RSNI documentation, complete and accurate documentation is going to affect the selection of your RSNI codes. As I mentioned, that term selective means the catheter has to be placed in that vessel for that study. And some examples of where that becomes significant with the renal arteries and the viscerals, and when I say viscerals, I'm talking about the celiac, the superior mesenteric, the inferior mesenteric, um, they may be visualized from a contrast injection in the abdominal aorta. So that's going to affect the coding, whether the catheter was in the aorta or whether the catheter went into any of those vessels. The same with the carotids, the origin of the subclavian and vertebrals may be visualized from a contrast injection in the aorta, an arch angiogram. Obviously, non-selective study arch angiogram is one code, and then selective studies would be additional codes. And then external carotids may be visualized from a common carotid injection, but they require selective catheterization in order to be reported. Okay, so let's talk briefly about head and neck catheterization. So I already showed you an example, um, pulling up the drawing of what head and neck catheterizations look like. Now, I usually get the question from people who know, who have been coding interventional radiology. They're like, why do you start out teaching us head and neck catheterizations when the diagnostic angiography codes now bundle catheterizations in that area? Why do you do that? Well, there are two reasons why I do that. There is a method to my madness. Number one, you, there are some rare occasions where you still have to assign catheterization codes for the head and neck. There's not a lot of times that you're doing it, but you have to know how to do it for those rare instances that you are. And then the second reason why I still start out teaching that way is because I feel like it's easier to um, illustrate that multiple vascular family concept using the head and neck because you have three distinct um, vascular families that you can easily visualize. If I were to jump over to the visceral drawing and show you all the abdominal vessels, it's way too busy and too complicated. I think you'd have a hard time following it. And then the extremities, you're really mainly dealing with just the right and the left extremity. So it's just an easier way to visualize the concepts. And so that's why I still do that. So if any of you were wondering, I always get that question, that's why. One, you still have to assign the, the codes in some cases. And two, it's just easier to visualize and comprehend those concepts because the concepts I just showed you on the head or the drawing of the head and neck vessels there, those are the same coding conventions and concepts that we're going to use when we're looking at the abdominal visceral procedures, the lower extremities, the upper extremities. Those coding rules do not change when we change areas of the body. So here are the um, head and neck catheterization codes. And we already looked at these codes earlier. Um, on a slide about non-selective catheterization. So these are the ones that are possibilities for non-selective um, catheterizations there. And then again, because we're above the diaphragm, these are the selective codes that we have to choose from. So here we have three vascular families, which you saw in the examples that I was showing you. We have the brachiocephalic um, family, the left common carotid and the left subclavian. And you now know that we're gonna code catheterizations for all three of those vascular families as you saw in the examples. And so now here at this point, we're just at a review. I kind of jumped ahead and started giving you examples because I didn't want to keep going down the path <laughs> without showing you um, the concepts I was talking about. 
So this is just reiterating the fact that each time you advance to another vessel, um, you know, you or you have the higher order vessel. That's all that is there. Now the bovine arch again, and I showed you an illustration of the bovine arch. This is where you can see that the branching pattern actually um, changes, and it will change the catheterization coating. Now anytime you have abnormal anatomy, it isn't just for a bovine arch that the abnormal branching pattern may you know, establish its own vascular family, you know, off of a particular vessel, and it can revise established vascular ordering. So that's important for you to know, and it could be a part of another vascular family of vessels. So here's these two side by side, so you can kind of get an idea of what I'm talking about and how it affects your coding. So if you look over at the drawing on the right hand side, which is a bovine arch configuration, that left common carotid is a second order, it's a 36216, but if you come over to the drawing on the left, that's normal anatomy, that left common carotid is a first order, it's a 36215. And so that's why you always wanna pay attention to that abnormal anatomy. Now, one little thing I'll just say, I'll add in here as like a bonus, like I said, we're not talking about that stuff today. I'm not gonna show you how to code for abnormal anatomy, but the physician may not always use the terminology that, you, that I have in the presentation for you here, like bovine arch or replaced right hepatic. What you might see instead in the report, rather than the physician saying that the patient has a replaced right hepatic artery, the physician might say that the right hepatic artery arises from the superior mesenteric artery. And so that way you know that the patient has a replaced right hepatic, but it's telling you the branching pattern. The SMA is a first order, now the replaced right hepatic, when, it, when that hepatic arises from the SMA, it becomes a second order rather than a third order in normal anatomy. Okay, and so the drawings in here are just as a reference for you. The reason why I put them in your handout is because the ones I'm using to walk you through examples, those are copyrighted and I cannot dis dis bleh, distribute them to you. So I've just included these in here for your reference. I know they're not like ideal, um, compared to the color-coded drawings, but at least you have something to refer to with catheterization codes. Now, I'm just briefly gonna mention these, that they exist. I'm not gonna talk about them because I'd have to spend about 15 or 20 minutes here talking about these, and we don't have time to do that today, and it wasn't the focus of the program. For head and neck angiography, we have these surgical codes that bundle the catheterization and the imaging portion. So I'm showing them here, I've included them in the slide deck just so you know that they exist, the same rules, though, that I just taught you for non-selective and selective catheterization coding are going to apply here when you're reading these code descriptions. You still have a non-selective code, 36211, then all your other codes that follow that all have selective in the, descript the descriptor, and then the correct code selection is going to depend upon which vessel the physician places the catheter in to do the imaging. And so that's what you, what you will want to focus on. And again, I'd have to go into a whole, you know, another set of explanations on how to apply those. But I wanted to focus on the component coding, which we're going to continue to do. And now we're going to look at upper extremity catheterizations and angiography. <clears throat> okay, so again, you're going to see we're using the same codes. There's no change in the codes that we're looking at. Our non-selective codes for the upper extremity, same two codes he listed here, we've been looking at for our other examples as well. Our selective codes that we have for the upper extremity are the 36215 through 36218. We are above the diaphragm. And then here we have the upper extremity and geography codes, which are very straightforward. We have a code for unilateral imaging. We have a code for bilateral imaging, that's 75716 there. And then we have the add-on code 75774. So I'm gonna stop and talk about that add-on code briefly right here, right now. This add-on code is going to be used across the board, across the body. So it's important to understand how to use 75774. So what the 75774 requires is that the catheter has been moved further during the procedure. So once a base code has been assigned one time, let's say you've already assigned the 75716 um, for a lower or upper extremity procedure, then the physician moves the catheter further, we have an additional selective catheterization, and then he does an additional study 
then you have the ability to pick up code 75774. And there is a slide specifically on 75774. Oh, there it is. I thought it was later in the presentation, but here we go. <laughs> so we are going to have this discussion now. I've been working on so many PowerPoints lately. I kind of forget, like, and I do different things in different order. And so anyway, they're all kind of like blending together. So with the add-on 75774, um, as I said, a base code can only be assigned one time per vascular family. So this is why we have this add-on code 75774. You want to make sure that the imaging of the vessels that's done, that these vessels weren't studied from a prior injection. You know, in addition to requiring that the cat the catheter was more selectively placed, you know, more, you know, that it was advanced further, you need to make sure that it's not repeat imaging of a vessel that was already imaged from a prior contrast injection. So those are the two things that you want to look out for with that code. And so here you'll see, you, I have side by side for you, upper extremity artery um, illustrations here. And so you can see how the coding looks depending upon the point of access. So on the left, you have access via the right brachial or axillary, and then it shows you how the catheter codes are assigned there. And then over on the right there, you'll see an upper extremity access via the right brachial or axillary. And now we're talking about actually going down the extremity rather than up towards the aorta. So that is actually going to change your coding, as you can see. Notice over on the left-hand side, when you puncture at that axillary or brachial, all the way up to the point of the aorta, that is going to be bundled. You're not going to assign anything else until you come into the aorta at 36200. So here, what would happen, remember what the example I showed you? You start out with a 36140, and then once you go into the aorta, you drop the 36140. The same thing is going to happen with your upper extremities. And then from there, if you go over into the contralateral extremity and place the catheter over there at any of these points, then you're going to drop the 36200 for the aortic for the aortic catheterization. So the same rules, we're just in a different area of the body. So I'm going to jump over to again and do some drawings for you. So let me pull up, here we go, we'll do this one. So this is a drawing of the upper extremities and this is done via access on the right or the left via the common femoral that we're looking at here. So I'm gonna do the same thing that I did before and just walk you through what a typical scenario may be like and then show you how to apply the catheterization codes. So again, we're visualizing that puncture down at the bottom of the drawing at that right common femoral artery. Once the physician punctures the vessel, remember that's a 36140. However, once the catheter goes into the aorta, we now have a 36200 and we drop the 36140. Then from there, let's say the physician catheterized the right subclavian and then also came down and catheterized the right ulnar. So here, again, just like with the head and neck that we were looking at, it's the same, same concept. We come off the aorta, come through that brachiocephalic into the right subclavian. That first catheter placement is a 36216 with all that lesser order work bundled, but the physician moves the catheter down to the right ulnar artery, which is a third order. So now that second order right subclavian is bundled because the furthest he moved the catheter was the right ulnar, all that other work up to that point is bundled into that code. That's a 36217. Again, physician may also go over into the extremity over here on the left. So again, would pull back the catheter, come over into the left subclavian, place the catheter there, then come over into the extremity over here, and then come into the left ulnar. So over here, we would have had a 36215, but then the catheter went further to a 36217. So now I'm going to talk to you about that concept with the imaging, the 75774, and how that would apply. So we had a catheter placement up here in the left subclavian, and we had a catheter placement up here in the right subclavian. So the physician does imaging, shoots contrast, does imaging. Right there, we would have a 75716 for that bilateral extremity imaging. But once the physician moves that catheter down into the left ulnar, into the right ulnar, now he's shooting contrast again 
and he's getting images all the way down to the hand when he shoots that contrast. We have that on both sides. This is where you could use that 75774 for each side. We've already assigned 75716. We can't assign it again. The physician did perform an additional selective catheterization. That's one of the criteria that we're looking for. And then the other thing is, did he do additional imaging that he didn't get from that prior catheterization? And so in this case, we're assuming that he didn't. Obviously, you're going to look at the findings in your report and try to figure that out, what was imaged from the first contrast injection versus the second. But here, the assumption is that it was separate imaging all the way down into the hand. And so then you have 75774 for the add-on there in the upper extremities. So now I'm going to hop back over to, oops, I have to erase it. Go back over here, and we're going to pick up with lower extremity and pelvic catheterizations and angiography. So the lower extremities, this is where you see a ton of procedures being done. I talk a lot about lower extremity therapeutic interventions because pretty much every facility, every client I work with, everybody's doing extremities. You may not see some of the other procedures done from facility to facility or, or radiology group to radiology group. So we have three, there are three vascular families technically here in the lower extremities. But the one, the middle sacral artery, that just comes directly off of the aorta and not really, you know, you don't see a whole lot of procedures done there. So really, we end up focusing on the right extremity and the left extremity for the most part as far as vascular families are concerned. So we're going to walk through um, the codes for the lower extremity and pelvic. And then again, I'm going to pull up a drawing and then I'll go through the catheterization coding and then just briefly touch on imaging coding. So vascular family, now when you come over into the lower extremities, the external iliac and the common femoral artery are considered to be the same vessel for coding purposes. So rather than the common femoral becoming a third order, it stays a second order with the external iliac artery, and you'll see that when we go over to a drawing. When the puncture site is located within an extremity vessel and the catheter is not advanced to the aorta, then the vascular families are determined from the vessel punctured. So what'll happen is that's what they're going down the extremity. They stay on the same side and they're doing that ipsilateral catheterization. So the example I gave here is when they access the common femoral artery and then they move the catheter antegrade and then that goes down to the superficial femoral, then that starts a vascular family. So that doesn't, that doesn't happen as commonly, but you need to know that, that that also starts a vascular family. And again, our extremity catheterization codes, we see they're the same for upper and lower, our non-selective catheterization codes. And then our lower extremity selective codes are the codes that we use for below the diaphragm procedures. So a few points about lower extremity catheterizations. You'll wanna pay close attention to your report um, and determine whether you have a contralateral or ipsilateral catheterization for correct code assignment. That absolutely affects your code assignment in your extremities. And then code 36140 should be assigned only when the catheter is not moved into the aorta or beyond the common femoral external iliac vessels. <clears throat> and then you will not assign code 36140 when the catheter is pulled back from the aorta or contralateral iliac into the ipsilateral one for imaging of the ipsilateral leg. And you're like, what exactly does that mean? So I'm going to jump over to a drawing and I'm going to show you that right now by walking you through what a lower extremity procedure would look like. Okay, so typical lower extremity procedure, we start out with the catheter being placed at the right common femoral. You see here, we start out with a 36140. Then from there, catheter may go into the aorta with contrast being injected for imaging. And then from there, catheter comes over into that external iliac and then eventually comes down into the superficial femoral. So here, again, we're applying the same rules that I've been discussing this whole, this whole session here. We have 36140 was our initial code, but once the physician moved from that common femoral and made it into the aorta, that is a 36200 at that point. And so we drop our 36140, but then when the catheter comes out of the aorta and we have a selective catheterization in the external iliac, 
that code becomes a 36246 with those lesser codes being bundled. And then once the physician moves into that third order vessel, the superficial femoral, that's a 36247. And then of course our 36246 gets bundled with that. So on that last slide, what I was just talking about with a pullback and not assigning 36140 for a pullback. So let's say after the physician does all this catheter work here, he comes back, he pulls the catheter back over into this common femoral, or maybe he even places it in the common iliac, and he decides to shoot contrast to do an extremity study over here on the right, which he may do. When he does that, you do not assign 36140 for that pullback. You wouldn't assign a, a non-selective catheterization code with the selective unless you had a separate access where there was non-selective. If you've already moved through this vessel into another vessel, you are not gonna select a code to report that pullback. You've already been there. You've already been on that path because you're coming back on the same path. There's nothing additional to report. The only time you report anything for a pullback is when you go into an additional vascular family, then you would go ahead and you would report that. So if the physician came back over here and then decided to go into the internal iliac right here, the red vessel there, the first order, you would assign 36245 because that's a selective catheterization. It would have been a selective catheterization even if you started here, because this is a first order branch off of the vessel that you had punctured. And so that's how that works in the lower extremities. So let me do another one in the lower extremities. And this time I'm gonna add some imaging um, on here for you. I don't, you know what, I think I'm gonna switch drawings. I think I have the, bilateral one that I can pull up. Yes, okay. So this one's gonna look a little bit different from the scenarios that we've, we've um, been using. So here, this drawing illustrates a procedure that is started from the right or left upper extremity. So now we're coming in through the upper extremities, down through the aorta, into the lower extremities. So now we have to visualize the catheter coming in, let's say at that left brachial over here. That is a 36140. Then the catheter comes down into the aorta. Once the catheter comes down into the aorta, we now have a 36200 that we're going to assign. So that 36140 gets bundled. So hopefully by now you can see the repetition here and the thought process when we're assigning our catheterization codes. Then from there, the physician places the catheter into the external iliac. And then let's say he does imaging here and then moves the catheter further down, goes into the anterior tibial, and then does imaging over here, and then comes back, pulls the catheter back, does the same work over here. First comes into the external iliac, does contrast there, then over here, anterior tibial again, and then imaging. So the codes for this scenario, again, our non-selective codes have been bundled. When we come over here to the right, 36246 describes that first catheter placement, but then the physician moved the catheter to the anterior tibial, so that becomes a 36247, and that 36246 gets bundled. We no longer assign that. And then the same is going to occur over here at our left extremity. That initial 36246 gets dropped when the physician moves the catheter into the anterior tibial, which is a third order vessel. So we would have 36247 for the left and then 36247 for the right. Now, as far as the imaging is concerned, again, I put this in here intentionally to show you how to use those add-on codes. This is one way you'd use the add-on code. We have 75716 for the bilateral imaging of the lower extremity. And then again, we had the additional selective catheterization for the anterior tibial on both sides for additional imaging down to the foot so that would give us code 75774 um, to report for each side for that particular imaging. So you just always want to remember what that imaging code. Remember, additional selective catheterization and then imaging that you didn't get from the prior study. That's what you're actually looking for there. So I know there's a little delay when I'm switching back. I have to go back and change the functions in the panel before I switch back over here. Okay, so now we're coming back over to our slides and I just walked you through that. 
So let me talk a little bit about the RS and I codes for the lower extremities and the pelvis. Just a few points I want to make here. Um, obviously, the extremity imaging codes are super straightforward, easy to apply. There seems to be a little bit of confusion, though, with the 75630, um, when to assign that, versus the 75625 and a 75716. So 75625 is for an aortogram, and then 75630 is for an aortogram with runoff. And then how to, um, in just a moment, I'm going to talk to you about what the, distingu what the distinguishing factor is in deciding how to code those scenarios. But briefly, I want to mention the 75736 code. It's for pelvic angiography. It says selective or super selective. So here we're seeing that, uh, the first example of an imaging code that has that term selective in the code descriptor. And that means that the catheter has to be in a pelvic vessel in order to report that code. It has to be a selective vessel. So we're talking about the internal iliac and then the branches of the internal iliac. That's what you would use the 757364. for. And then of course we have the add-on code, which we would also use with the pelvic code as well. So back to the abdominal aortogram issue. 75625 requires a full and complete abdominal aortogram. And so what that means is you should see at a minimum, at least dimension, the origins of the renals, the celiac, the superior mesenteric, the inferior mesenteric. Oftentimes when a physician is saying that they're doing an abdominal aortogram, they may not be doing a full abdominal aortogram as far as our coding is concerned. For example, if they're just mentioning the distal abdominal aorta, you cannot code 75625 when they only mention findings for the distal abdominal aorta. You also cannot code 75630 when they only mention the distal abdominal aorta. 75630 requires the components of 75625. So you can't go ahead and do a 75630, and that's a common error that I see. So to determine whether you use a 75625 or a 75630 for a study, you want to look at the catheter positioning. If you have one catheter placement in the aorta, and then they inject the contrast, and then the contrast runs down into the extremities, that is a runoff study. It's one catheter placement, runoff study 75630. If they place the catheter in the aorta, shoot contrast, do an abdominal aortogram, then pull the catheter down to the aortic bifurcation, now we have two catheter placements in the aorta, that's where we assign 75625 and 75716. So that's what you're going to look for. Was it one catheter placement and one continuous study for a 75630? Or was it two separate catheter placements in the aorta for the aortogram and the extremity study? And that's the example for you here on slide 63. So the pelvic selective code 75736 you will assign that for each selective pelvic vessel studied. Um, so this is a unilateral code. So you can report it. Remember I told you you can only report a base code one time? Well, this code is unilateral. So you can report 75736 once for the right and then 75736 once for the left. Once you have used it for a particular side, then you would use code 75774 for additional pelvic vessels. <clears throat> and I will show you an illustration with that. And then if a doctor is doing a non-selective pelvic study, depending upon the documentation and the findings that are noted, a non-selective pelvic study may be coded with either 75630 or 75716. But again, that is going to depend on how the findings are documented. And then once again, we have the add-on code. This slide is identical to the one that I showed you earlier. I just put it in this section again um, to remind you of the rules for applying 75774. So before we go on to abdominal catheterizations and angiography, I'm going to pop back over to the drawings we were just looking at because I want to show you on the drawing an example of pelvic, pelvic catheterization and pelvic imaging before we move on. Okay, so this is what a typical procedure may look like. So I'm going to show you a procedure where they're going and they're catheterizing the uterine arteries. So here we're going to use this drawing. Access is gained at that right common femoral. So we start with a 36140. 
then the catheter goes into the internal iliac over here on the right. We see that's a three, six, two, four, five, a first order. But then from there, the catheter goes into the internal iliac right here. And I know these vessels, you know, we start to get, they're really tiny and it's hard to see, it's hard to visualize, but that internal iliac is a three, six, two, four, six. So once we have moved the catheter there, the three, six, two, four, five is bundled, just like our three, six, one, four, zero got bundled. And then the physician moves the catheter again into the uterine artery. That would is now a third order vessel. So our catheterization code for all the work that we just saw here is three, six, two, four, seven. Now let's assume that the physician did imaging from all of these positions. So the catheter was put into that internal iliac, that first one, remember it was the first order, that initial imaging there, that's selective pelvic imaging, that's 75736. Then the catheter got, in, got moved into the internal iliac, okay? And so now if we have separate imaging here in the internal iliac, we can't use 75736 again for the same side, we have to use 75774. And then likewise, we move the catheter into the uterine arteries, that third order vessel, to do further imaging in the uterine arteries. That also will have to be a 75774 because we can't use the 75736 for that. But if the catheter had been moved over the aortic bifurcation into that contralateral left extremity, if that um, left internal iliac over here had been catheterized and imaging had been performed, we can assign 75736 for that because it's a separate vascular family. So with your imaging codes, you can assign the base code once for a vascular family, then after that, you're going to go to your add-on codes. Okay, so I'm gonna erase, and we're gonna jump back over here, okay. Back to our slides. current slide. Okay, so now we're going to move into the abdominal visceral vessels and take a look at those. Now, this is where the coding gets a little crazy because you have more vascular families that you're dealing with. And looking at the illustration, the illustration gets really, really busy <laughs> with lots of vessels and lots of branches. Um, but the five main vascular families that you're dealing with here, there's many, many different vascular families that branch directly off the aorta. But the main ones um, are the celiac, the left renal, right renal, superior mesenteric, and inferior mesenteric. And then lumbar spinal arteries and even thoracic spinal arteries, those are their own vascular family directly off the aorta when you're talking about spinal angiography. So again, here's a drawing for your reference. Um, like I said, it's a very busy, busy drawing um, to take a look at. Even with the color-coded drawing, it's a, little, it's a little busy. So with the arterial abdominal system, this is where you really have to watch abnormal branching patterns. There are, are many cases where there's abnormal anatomy with a patient, and so you'll want to be aware of that. As I mentioned earlier, the physician may not tell you that the patient has a replaced right hepatic artery. He may not use that terminology, but when you're reading the report, he may say that the hepatic artery, the right hepatic artery arises from the superior mesenteric artery. And then you're like, okay, because it comes off the superior mesenteric artery, which is a first order, that means that it must be a second order. Whereas if it was normal anatomy, that artery would have been a third order. It would have been in a completely different family. So that's why it's important to really pay attention to um, the details in the report and look for information like that where the patient has abnormal anatomy and how it will affect the coding. So our non-selective catheterizations, again, these are the same catheterization codes that we've seen already throughout the presentation. And then our abdominal catheterizations, we're talking below the diaphragm. So these will be 36245 through 36248. Imaging codes, you'll see some familiar. I'm not going to repeat myself on the 75625, 75630. The 75726, so let's take a look at this one because this is specific to those visceral vessels. And notice that it says in the code description, again, we have that terminology selective or supraselective. 
which means that the catheter has to be placed into one of those visceral vessels when that contrast is injected for that study. And then also notice in the code description, it says with or without flush aortogram. So what that tells you is that when an aortogram is performed, a 75625, say for example, is performed, then the physician moves the catheter further into one of the visceral vessels and does selective imaging there, then 75625 is bundled with 75726, and that is not going to be reported separately. But again, that has selective in the descriptor, which means the catheter has to be placed in a visceral vessel. So some examples of that would be the celiac, when it goes into there, the superior mesenteric or the inferior mesenteric or any of those branches there. Other Now, other uses for the 75726, I've listed them here for you. Again, that's more advanced stuff. I'm not talking about that today, but it's there as an FYI that these codes have many different uses and sometimes your clinical indication and what's being evaluated exactly um, can be a deciding factor in that. But for purposes of our discussion today, we're focused on the celiac, superior mesenteric, and inferior mesenteric. So just a few more codes to mention, not gonna go through any examples with these today, but we have codes for the adrenal, adrenals, 75731 unilateral, 75733 for bilateral, 75705 is for selective spinal angiography, so you would use the 75705 for all of the spinal arteries um, that come directly off of the aorta. You would assign that per spinal artery. And then we also have our add-on code 75774, which again, the same rules are going to apply as with the other areas. And then just briefly before I jump over and show you some examples on how to apply catheterization codes for the visceral studies and look at some of the imaging codes, I wanted to talk briefly about renal angiography. This is unique in like the head and neck codes. We have a surgical code that bundles the catheter code and bundles the imaging code. And I wanted to specifically talk, I didn't get into the head and neck because they are kind of their own different animal, but here there's a reason why I'm getting into this because this is gonna factor into whether or not you assign some of the other codes in this area of the body. So I felt like I really needed to stop and just talk about this for a few moments. So with these codes, 36251, 36254, there are a bunch of components that are bundled into these codes, which are listed for you here. So the access and catheter placements, they're bundled, your L, your contrast injections, your RSNI, that imaging portion, um, image post-processing, gradient measurements, the flush aortogram, the 75625, that would be bundled with these codes, and then closure as well. So these are inclusive codes for the renals. And so briefly, I just wanna look at these code descriptions. So what we see here, codes 36251, 36252. Note that in the code description, it says selective catheter placement first order main renal artery, okay? That's the first part of the code description. That's the same for 36251 and 36252. So here, what you wanna see to assign this code is that the catheter was placed into the main renal artery. When the catheter is placed into the main renal artery, it's either a 36251 for a unilateral study or it's a 36252 for a bilateral study. Now also notice that it says, and any accessory renal arteries for renal angiography. That means whether or not the patient has accessory renal arteries doesn't make a difference from the diagnostic imaging perspective. Whether they have one accessory renal or three accessory renals, it's still gonna be either a 36251, 36252, any imaging of accessory renals is bundled. And then when we come over to the next slide, here the difference between 36251 and 36252 is that over here, these codes say in the code description, super selective catheter placement, one or more second order or higher renal artery branches. So that's the difference. So for renal angiography, when it goes into the, the catheter goes into the main renal artery, first order, it's 251 or 252. As soon as the catheter moves out of that main renal artery and goes into a branch to do imaging, then it becomes a 36253 or a 36254 depending upon whether it's unilateral or it's bilateral. 
and then 36253, 36254 are reported once, regardless of how many second order or higher vessels are studied. So it's one and done. With these codes, whatever code applies, it's one and done. And then there's our drawing again. So, ooh, okay, so good. I'm doing good on time. So then I have some time to walk you through some examples over here. I'm so proud of myself. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna come over here. So now you can see we're looking at a different drawing for the visceral um, studies. And so again, because we're dealing with more vascular families, we're dealing with more vessels, it becomes a little bit more challenging to visualize these procedures and apply these same coding rules. So none of the coding conventions that we've been applying in the other body areas change here. It's still going to be the same when we're assigning our catheterization codes. So again, I'm going to just plot a procedure here for you, a common procedure. So now we're gonna start reviewing our basics and then we'll get into the newer part of this here. Okay, so we start with all our other procedures just to keep it simple for today's session access at that right common femoral artery. Then from there, the physician places the catheter into the aorta. So I put the X there. So remember, once the catheter goes into the aorta, 36140, that code for the initial puncture actually goes away. And now we have code 36200. <clears throat> Excuse me. So then after that, the physician moves the catheter into the celiac. And you know, I'm gonna mark imaging as I'm going through this. So we're gonna kind of you know kill two birds with one stone here. So we've got imaging that was done of the aorta, an abdominal aortogram from that catheter placement. Then the catheter goes into the celiac trunk. Imaging is done here. Then the physician moves the catheter into the left hepatic, does imaging there. Then the physician moves the catheter into the right hepatic and does imaging there. So let's talk through this scenario. So once the catheter comes out of the aorta and goes into the celiac trunk, that's a first order vessel, a 36245. So that means the 36200 goes away. Then once the catheter comes into the left hepatic, a third order, 36247, the 36245 is bundled and that's no longer assigned. Catheters pulled back, goes over into the right hepatic after the left hepatic. That's also a third order vessel. Remember, we cannot assign 36247 twice in the same vascular family. So that second one becomes a 36248. So catheterization codes would be 36247, 36248 for this scenario. All the lesser orders are going to be bundled. Now, as far as the imaging is concerned, we first had an abdominal aortogram, which was coded with 75625. However, once the catheter went into the celiac trunk and ang selective angiography was done there, that becomes a 75726. And remember, 75625 is bundled with 75726. So we drop the 75625 here. So now the imaging code, that non-selective imaging is going to get swallowed up by the selective imaging code. And then from there, after we've assigned the 75726 for the celiac, we can't assign it for the left hepatic. We've already used it for this family. So that makes the left hepatic a 75774. And then over here, it makes the right hepatic as well a 75774. So that's one example there. So let me do some more over here. Let's do, again, I'm gonna keep the point of access the same catheter in the aorta. Um, so let's assume here, so the catheter is in the aorta. This is one I'm just gonna keep simple just to illustrate this point I was just making with the renal angiography. So the access is gained at that right common femoral, catheter goes into the aorta and the physician does an aortogram and from the aortogram, he notes findings for the right renal artery, and he notes findings for the left renal artery. So in this case, it would not be appropriate to assign code 36252 for the renal imaging because the physician did the study, only catheterized the aorta to inject the contrast and gave you findings for the renals as part of the abdominal aortogram. So you would not use 36252 for that bilateral study. 
you would only assign that if the catheter went into the right renal, the catheter went into the left renal, then you would have a 36252. And then once that occurs, then the, the aortogram, the 75625 would be bundled. So a non-selective renal imaging study, 75625, a selective is 36251, 52, 53, 54, with the abdominal aortogram bundled if that was done prior. So now let me show you, let's put up a really fun case here with a lot of steps in it. So again, I'm gonna start with the axis at the right extremity. And this time we're gonna do multiple vascular families. So catheter goes into the inferior mesenteric, goes into the left colic, and we're gonna do imaging from all of our catheter placements as well. Um, superior mesenteric, and then from there, we'll also do the right colic. And then up here, we'll come into the celiac, do imaging there, come over into the left gastric and do imaging there, and then come back over into the left hepatics where we were, right hepatics where we were before. And let's see, what else do I wanna do? And let's do catheterization and imaging of the splenic, okay. Now, the odds of you getting a case that looks like this probably are not very good, but I do this so you can get an idea of how to apply the codes when you have multiple catheterizations with a visceral study. You will have situations where there are multiple catheterizations, multiple families, multiple branches, and you'll have to know how to work your way through that. So remember our coding rules from the beginning of today's session where we're going to code for each vascular family separately. So we have three vascular families that we're coding for here. So there's one of them, there's two of them, and then there's three of them. So it's almost like you're coding three procedures separately, okay? So I'm gonna start down here. We'll start with the inferior mesenteric family. So the physician gained access to that right common femoral, moved the catheter into the aorta. So once the catheter goes into that inferior mesenteric, our non-selective catheterizations are bundled. So we have a 36245 for that catheterization, but then the catheter gets moved into the left colic. So then that becomes a 36246 and that 36245 is bundled, okay? So that's what we have for the catheterization code here. Now in this family for the imaging codes, the initial vessel, that first visceral vessel, the inferior mesenteric, is a 75726. And then for the additional imaging in the same family, the left colic is a 75774. When we come over here into our second vascular family, the superior mesenteric, that is a 36245, but the catheter gets pulled back, goes into the right colic, which is a 36246. So the 36245 is bundled and the only catheterization code we have for this family is our 36246. As far as the imaging is concerned, it's going to look the same as for our inferior mesenteric family. That initial superior mesenteric angiogram, 75726, we do assign it again because it's a separate vascular family. And then now we're gonna use our add-on code for the right colic, 75774. So that means when we come up here to our third vascular family, we're gonna start over again with our imaging codes. And so for imaging, we're going to have 75726 for the celiac imaging that was performed. And then we're going to use 75774 for all of the other imaging performed in this family, the splenic, the left gastric, the left hepatic, and the right hepatic. Those are all add-on codes. Now, as far as the catheterizations here are concerned, we started in this family at a first order with the celiac 36245, but catheter went into the left hepatic. So that's a 36247. So the lesser order catheterization 36245 is bundled. Then we have a pullback, catheter goes into the right hepatic. We have another 36247, okay? Now we didn't finish coding the vascular family yet. So I'm gonna hold off on giving you the final, <laughs> the final verdict here. The so physician pulls the catheter back and comes over into the left gastric. So now we're in a different branch of the same vascular family. So here we have a 36246, and then catheter was pulled back and advanced into yet another branch in the family. 
that is a three, six, two, four, six. Okay. Now, sometimes the temptation is for the coder to say, okay, I'm going to assign three, six, two, four, seven, and then I'm going to pick up, uh, or I'm sorry, then I'm going to pick up the three, six, two, four, six, three, six, two, four, six, and then three, six, two, four, seven, three, six, two, four, eight. And they want to assign for all of those differently. Actually, you would not. It's the same vascular family. Okay. So what you would be doing here is within this vascular family, you have to say, what's the highest order catheterized by the physician? The highest order catheterized was a 36247. We had two of them. So remember, we can't code 36247 two times. We can only code it one time. So that means that second one becomes a 36248. So what happens over here when we have a second order in the same family? The second order catheterization in the same family is bundled with a third order. So we cannot report that separately. We need to change the 36246 for the left gastric to a 36248 and also change the splenic here to a 36248. Why do we do that here, but we didn't do that? We didn't make any changes down below with the other families because this is all one vascular family. So we use the add-on code. You pick the highest order within the family, then you use the add-on code for the additional second or third order. You're only going to code second order per, you know, over here, it's like we had a second order for this family and a second order for here. Because they're separate vascular families, we do code the 36246 for each one and we don't use the add-on code. So hopefully that kind of helps you understand that concept of I use the add-on code here, I don't use the add-on code here. It's within the same vascular family Otherwise, you're just going to use the code <clears throat> one time. So we're going to erase drawings here, and then I'm going to go back over. A lot of flipping back and forth today. I think I'm going to be dizzy after this. <laughs> okay, so before I, I wrap up, I am, I am so impressed with how well I did like on time today. I tried to find a way to condense the material and still give you the the highlights and the time that we had. So just some things I want to mention for those of you who are listening today. Um, I have some promo codes out there for you. Um, I have a book called Cracking the IR Code. It is an 800 page book. It's a comprehensive reference manual for interventional radiology coding. It's been out for now five, six years. It gets rave reviews. Um, if you want to check that out, you can just go to my website, radrx.com and go to the resources tab and learn more information about that. Um, it's really good um, for beginners, those who are just starting out. It's very detailed, um, so you may want to check that out. And then if you like what you heard today, um, then and you're looking for something more in-depth for interventional radiology um, coding training, I have an online training course where tons of people have taken it. I've helped a lot of coders get their CIRCC certification. Um, coders with little or no IR experience have taken this course, and they have sat for the CIRCC and passed on the first time. So I've got a bunch of testimonials on my website about that, also additional information um, about the course. But if you've been struggling with interventional radiology coding, I really feel like my course is the answer for you. A lot of people, when they finally found me, they're like, oh, I wish I would've found you years ago um, <laughs> with all the time and money um, that I've spent. So um, it's been very successful and I'd like to have you, you know, join me over there. Basically how I was instructing you today that's what I do in my course, only a lot more of it. The stuff we cover today, we spend five to six hours on it, um, you know, in the course, just repetition. And you get to do a lot of coding exercises and a lot of practice. So you may want to consider that. And then if you're thinking about taking your certification exam, we do actually have a practice um, assessment. We call it our IR skills assessment, but it's also the practice exam. You may want to consider that. And I'd love to connect with you all on social media. Um, we've got some Facebook discussion groups if you want to check those out where you can network with other coders. We've got one for diagnostic radiology, interventional radiology, um, contact information. Again, you can go to the website and find out information about the products there. You can send emails to info at radarx.com. And we're just now coming up on 2.30. So I kind of figured we wouldn't have time for like Q&A just because I had so much information to cover. But if you have any questions about today's webinar, I definitely want to answer them for you. So you can feel free to send an email to info at radrx.com um, with your question. And just I would ask that they pertain to today's webinar content 
the purpose of this is not for a free coding consultation, okay? We will weed those out. Um, we do not provide normally coding advice via email. We actually have to have a contractual relationship, but if it pertains to a webinar, we will do that. So what I would ask for you to do is put the webinar title and webinar date in your subject line. Um, so I know when it comes in, they can be filtered and we can make sure that your questions get answered because otherwise we're not gonna be able, we won't know that you attended the webinar and the question won't um, get answered. So anyway, that's all I have to say for today. So here's the last slide about receiving your AHIMA CEU credit. Um, you can complete a brief evaluation at the link on the slide. And I'm not sure, Sharon, am I turning it back over to you? Karen, both of you, do you have any final comments? Hey, this is Karen. Yeah, I do have one question that did come up quite a bit, and that is the reference book where the color illustrations, is that your book or is that different? Are you able to tell us? A lot of people are really loving that book, so I don't know what you can tell us about that. Okay, well, the colored illustrations, unfortunately, are not mine. I wish they were. I wish I could claim them. Um, so I actually purchased those for medical asset management. I've had those for years since I've started out in IR, and when people ask me, like, whose illustrations do you recommend? Many, I will tell you, many companies sell them. MedLearn sells them, Z Health Publishing sells them, Medical Asset Management sells them. My, I have them from every company and I just like those the best. It's my personal preference. You can go to their website, you can get information from them about that. I get paid nothing um, you know, for mentioning them. There's no financial incentive for me to promote them over anyone else, it's just a preference. Um, and I use those in teaching because I feel that they're one of the better sets to use. Thank you for sharing that with us. Sharon, you're welcome. Yeah, thank you so much, Stacy. And I, I did just want to follow up on the questions. So there were a lot of questions that were submitted um, through the, the GoToWebinar platform. So I can, I can send those to you, and that way you have all the questions that you know came from attendees on, on today's webinar. It's up to you. Um, uh, rather than having people email you, or if people are going to email you, that's fine. But I do have a list of um, some other questions that are all collected. Yeah. Um, so, one, yeah. so those questions that you've collected, so then when you send them to me, if you collected them, are they going to have their email address attached to them so I can respond? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yep. No, if they were submitted yep. that way, feel free to forward those. And if somebody didn't get their question, I know some people will be listening on demand as well. Um, so if you miss getting the question yeah. in the chat box, then they can just email me directly. Um, you know, okay. following, you know, like I said, putting the title of the webinar and the date and the subject line, and then I can respond to them. Perfect. That's great. Thank you so much. There were tons of questions, tons of interest. So we really appreciate you uh, taking the time to present for us today. And to everybody on the webinar, this slide just again gives you the directions if you want to jump in and take your CEU um, certificate now. This link is now live. Um, so you should be able to do that. But again, for everybody viewing on demand and for everybody else, there will be an email that comes out tomorrow and it will contain all the information you need to get your CEU. Um, so you can also sit tight. Um, but if you're if you are viewing this webinar on demand, this is the URL you need uh, to access uh, the CEU certificate. So thanks everybody for joining. Thanks again, Stacy, and um, thanks Karen for all your help. And we look forward to seeing everyone on our next uh, True Code webinar. Thank you. Have a great afternoon, everyone.